I am really excited to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm Kimberly Kirkland and um, really what I wanted to do with this presentation is provide you with um, just kind of a very high up view of the growing field of arts and health. But before I begin, I know you heard a little bit about my background, but I want to provide a little context for this talk by um, giving a little bit of information about my journey to this field. Um, I've been at the UAB, University of Alabama at Birmingham for 20 years now, and I started when I was 23 years old and I needed a job with health insurance. Uh, and I began in the Department of Surgery here, and then I found my way to the Alice uh, Stevens Center. And this was really um, a really great opportunity for me because my background, as you heard, is in uh, the arts. And in fact, um, you know, my Bachelor of Music is in musical theater. And when I moved back to Birmingham for personal reasons, I, I thought that my chance of working in my beloved field uh, would be pretty non-existent if I were to stay in Birmingham. But getting to the Alice Stevens Center allowed me to see that um, a career in the field of arts does not have to necessarily include me being on a stage. So I um, found my way to the Masters of Arts Administration program, where I um, soon moved into the role of education director and really got a sense of how the arts impact people's lives. Um, I knew what it meant for me personally, but it was really powerful to see it in um, the context of, of education and community arts. And I was mesmerized by, you know, what a thousand children would come into the Alice Stevens Center and and get to see uh, performances and have the opportunity to talk with well-known artists who inspired them to push limits and take artistic risks. And it wasn't until we brought artists into the classroom. So um, Sharif Simmons, who you can see he's in the top middle there. That's actually him in the classroom. Um, I had the great uh, pleasure of working with him. He's a professional poet, um, and musician, and he created a six week weekly program called the Poets Corner from the page to the stage. And he would enter a classroom of children. Um, they'd be interested in what he was doing, but a little skeptical, but he is still and always has been a very hip guy. Um, and he would simply open and warm the group up by playing um, a piece on his guitar while reciting um, his beautiful spoken word poetry. And he threw this one particular song um, titled or poem called She Was, um, he created images of faraway places where he had grown up and um, stories of first love. And the students and teachers were always just sucked right in. Um, and it didn't matter where the school was, if it was a, a city of Birmingham school, a rural school, a private school, everyone loved him. And he talked about using their imagination um, to write and how that could be incorporated in their schoolwork. And then they would each uh, write and come to the front of the class and he would accompany them on his guitar while they shared their, their poetry. And as you can imagine, that can be pretty uh, intimidating and um, scary, but um, also in the best, uh, some of my favorite schools, the teachers are really engaged as well. And they would also um, share their work and come up in front of the class and perform. And the kids love to be able to see their vulnerability and their artistic creation as well. And it appeared that they, the children were growing more confident in their writing and performing and um, seeing children so excited in the classroom was, was really amazing. Uh, and, and arts integration uh, into core curriculum subjects continues to expand in schools and uh, provides a really impactful way of, of learning. And then in 2011, we entered the world of creative aging. Um, so on the lower right corner, that's one of our, our groups. Um, and we were offering uh, classes to senior adults in HUD subsidized facilities um, where they can connect with one another, have opportunities to express themselves creatively 
creatively and learn new skills in various art forms. And uh, so this just continued to um, increase my love for this work. And so I learned about the University of Florida and all their incredible work um, and got my master's in arts and medicine there. Um, and so that allowed us to start a pilot project at UAB Hospital. And our evaluations told us that um, when we took arts, particularly to the bedside or in workshop, uh, workshop spaces, patients would uh, simply fill out a little pre and post interaction survey, um, uh, kind of noting their level of perceived pain and anxiety on a scale of one to 10. And 93% um, of the patients uh, responded with that they had experienced some reduction in one of both of those areas for anyone who had had a specific level of pain or anxiety before the interaction. And by uh, 2014, we had a full program with professional artists and residents and offense in the hospital and uh, away we went. And so now as I continue my, my journey um, in this field, I'm looking to add more of a, a therapeutic lens, mental health, um, as I'm uh, currently in the, in the um, master's in clinical mental health program from the School of Education at UAB. And I am actually starting my first public health class um, at, at UAB in the spring. And so I'm very excited to continue to um, look at this work through, through different lenses. So now, Today, I hope to, um, we'll discuss the historical context of arts, creativity, and healing, the fields and professionals that make up the field. Uh, we'll discuss the different subfields within arts and health, describe examples of arts and health programs around the globe, and, uh, and we'll infuse that with uh, different research studies and kind of the future direction of research. So, uh, Humans and our ancestors have been creating art for tens of thousands of years and possibly longer. And if you look at the lower right hand corner, the Venus of Tan Tan is arguably um, one of the oldest pieces of um, known examples of sculpture, and it could be as old as 500,000 years old. And uh, some experts believe it is one of the earliest of the Venus figures um, that may have been carved uh, for use in fertility rituals. And so this is um, one of the very first examples of arts and health. And other art at this time was made up, as you can see, by simple um, markings carved in rock. But it was around uh, 40,000 BCE, there was a shift in the art. It became uh, more complicated and, and there was more representational images involved in the art. Um, well, the well, the human voice, of course, and the human body is believed to be the first, um, the earliest of instruments. Flutes have been discovered in caves in Germany that might be uh, over 40,000 years old. And these instruments were created from bear and bird bone and mammoth ivory. And additionally remains found um, from graves during the Upper Paleolithic time also show that animal skin drums were in use at this time. Uh, examples of musical instruments and early works of visual arts have been found actually in caves all over the world. Uh, when you look at the right hand side, that image is um, uh, where essentially our human ancestors would put their hand close to the cave wall, uh, pick up some red uh, clay dust, throw it against their hand, and it would create. Uh, the image of their hand. And then as we um, moved forward in time, uh, you can see that the images get a little more complex and very detailed. So on the left, you can see um, the lions portrayed in here, um, rhinoceroses, things that they might have seen um, on one of their Hunts. And then on the right hand side is the um, depiction of agriculture in the, the hunter gatherer as they move beyond that phase. So, knowing all of that, we wonder what is art for? Why do we have art? Well, 
Ellen Dasanayaki. She's a pioneer in the field of evolutionary aesthetics. She has done a lot of work in this area and she has come up with the following. Um, that art can is a tool to make things special. Um, jewelry even is uh, this in the lower right hand corner, you can see um, this, this, the shell uh, necklace and the shell uh, essentially beads uh, date back to again around 40,000 BCE. So, so our ancestors were even using um, jewelry to decorate, to adorn ourselves. Um, also decorative designs were found in, in pots and bowls um, from archeology. span And another example um, is that it can shape and thereby exert some measure of control um, over everyday life. Also, a key thing here is that it can make socially important activities gratifying. Um, physically and emotionally, it's, it's been a part of social and ri religious rituals. And of course, it continues to have important um, roles in, in religious rituals and social rituals as well. And also it, it, music. Music may have um, originated from mother ease. Um, experts talk about the possibility that our brains have been wired for music because of the sing song language, the way our mother or caregiver uh, spoke with us and communicated with us as um, infants and children. So interestingly, um, arts have been a part of healing rituals for since ancient times, and it's believed that they were even a part of, of uh, healing rituals during prehistoric times. Um, experts believe that shamans came to be around the same period, about 40,000 BCE, using found drums, instruments, dance, theatrics, and costumes during healing rituals. And while we can't know exactly um, what occurred um, during prehistoric rituals. Um, scientists continue to find um, evidence of the arts being infused in healing rituals in ancient Egypt, Greece, Rome, um, using music and visual art, dance, and theater as part of healing rituals. Um, so if you look at the center, top center photograph, um, that was a temple of Asclepius. So the Greek and Roman god Apollo, who, who combined, uh, his role was combined as a healer, a musician, and a poet, uh, was the father of Asclepius. Now you might recognize this uh, image down in the middle, that's the rod of Asclepius, and also known as the, it's the modern day uh, symbol for medicine. And so we, we can really find examples throughout history of the arts being woven into um, healing ceremonies. And today in traditional um, cultures, we still see this. So on the right hand side, there's a healing ceremony um, and they incorporate drumming and singing as a form of communication in, in West Africa. So how do we experience the arts today? Um, I don't know if you've all been to the Birmingham Museum of Art, but um, this painting on the right um, by Bierstadt is, is, is a large painting and it's quite beautiful. And I think this speaks to the concept of aesthetics, but aesthetics has been um, described as emphasizing the experience of art as a form of knowing and a means of conveying the truth. It makes ordinary moments feel extraordinary. And um, there's a heightened awareness of the present moment. As I look at this painting, um, I'm overcome by a sense of beauty, awe, um, intense emotion, and new and meaningful perspectives about oneself or the world can, can come out of these um, aesthetic experiences. There are also a new field called neuroaesthetics that continues to look at how our brain uh, responds to art and um, aesthetics. Narrative and storytelling as well. Um, since prehistoric times, oral, oral histories and oral stories have been passed um, along generations. Um, and narrative can be um, communicated 
via poetry, theater, music, dance. And of course there can be stories in, in paintings and visual images as well. And our stories can elicit emotion, empathy and understanding by highlighting individual and community experiences and values. Um, it, it provides opportunities for human connection uh, it provides for meaning making opportunities so we can understand our experiences or make sense of our experiences and it helps us understand what it is to be human. Um, it also provides when uh, also when you are creating that or experiencing it, it can provide healing and catharsis, um, especially when we even bring in things like the creative arts therapies. So now we'll transition to um, the, the world, the field of arts in health. Um, and the arts uh, are an integral part. People who believe in, um, believe in the, um, the field of arts and health and believe in the role of arts and how it can improve health, believe that it's an integral component to our health and well-being, um, as supported by Research and human experience uh, can be used in healthcare, medical education, pre disease prevention and maintenance, and public health and well being. And arts and health, it's, it's a field dedicated to using the power of the arts to enhance health and well being in diverse institutional and community contexts. And it's comprised of uh, many different fields. Um, arts and health supports health as defined by the World Health Organization, which states that um, health is complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease. And today we'll look at um, these four areas um, briefly. We'll get a brief overview of, of arts and medicine or arts and healthcare, um, arts to support caregivers, informal and formal, arts and medical education, and arts and community and public health. So practitioners um, in the field of arts and health, um, there are many, but uh, some of the, the, the main players uh, include artists or artists in residency, artists in residence um, in any modality, any of the arts modalities. They can create work of works of art for institutions to enhance healing and well being, or they can provide arts and creative experiences in a variety of uh, different environments. Um, they're professionals with experience, so they, they have professional degrees or they're practicing professionals in their art form. Um, and they also have training and experience navigating complex um, environments like healthcare environments and um, the ability to work with diverse populations. Then we have the uh, creative arts therapies. There's six well-established credentialed health professionals um, that use distinct arts-based methods and creative processes to address disability and illness and enhance health and wellness. Um, some treatment outcomes may include um, improving communication and expression, increasing physical, emotional, and cognitive um, or social functioning. And the creative arts therapies actually began around the 1940s um, as they were used to aid in the recovery of soldiers returning from World War II. Uh, expressive arts therapy is another area um, that uh, it's a professional field combining all different art forms um, and other creative processes to foster deep personal growth and community development. So um, now we'll move into the um, area of arts and medicine or arts and healthcare. And that's where our, uh, our program um, has, has been, um, the most of our work has taken place there. And arts and medicine has um, started in the mid 20th century to enhance the healthcare experience and then expanded to address health and wellness across the lifespan. Um, a growing number of medical centers have formal art programs. Um, and so I'll continue to talk about that while uh, giving you some information about the work that we do. 
So our mission is to, again, transform the environment of care and enhance well-being and healing through creative arts experiences for our patients, families, and staff. So it's part of a patient-centered, whole-person approach to care, addressing the needs of the, the mind, body, and spirit. So some of the, the benefits that have been um, found through, through research over the past 30 years um, include um, reduced stress levels, um, reduced perceived pain, improved mood, distraction from medical problems. Um, it can uh, reduce the length of stay, increase well-being. Um, it allows for self-expression, meaning-making, social connectedness. It provides a sense of control in, in a time where people might not feel like they have a, a lot of control over what's happening for them. Um, improved quality of life and, and self-confidence as they learn new skills. And then um, expanding on that, a recent scoping review of the field by uh, Fan Court and Finn in 2019, it was actually commissioned by the World Health Organization, um, found that the arts helped to prevent the onset of mental illness and age-related physical decline. Um, it can support the treatment or management of mental illness. Uh, non-communicable diseases and neurological disorders, and it's used to assist in acute and end-of-life care. So when we look at our program, what was the name of that review again? I wanted to write that down so I could look it up. Oh, sure. Um, well, I have it at the end of my, okay. um, in the, the, the references. Awesome. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, that sounded exciting. Sure. Um, so with our physical environment, we look at um, how we can enhance the space around us. Um, so we can do that through um, performances in public spaces. We can do that through um, visual art installations, both temporary and uh, permanent arts installations. And this can, again, like, Harkening back to what we talked about with the um, aesthetics is it can provide a sense of awe, of wonder, temporarily um, take people out of, of the space of a hospital, whether they're um, staff or um, patients and family members. Um, different elements of, of arts and health and, and healthcare include healthcare design, evidence-based healthcare design, um, nature. So they're um, in different hospitals. There are more healing gardens that are being incorporated into the healthcare environment. Um, a lot of hospitals have permanent art collections. And of course, it also can enhance the um, patient experience. Another area that we work um, in the hospital setting is um, through arts engagement. So that is with at the bedside and in group workshops. And we have um, seven artists in residence um, at UAB Hospital, and then we work with creative arts therapists um, out in, in other hospital settings and in other um, work that um, really go into a, a patient's room or a workshop and provide opportunities for um, self-expression and creativity and really provide that uh, individual with an opportunity to um, maybe have a break from the healthcare uh, room, the space that they're in, reconnect with who they are when they're not in the hospital environment. Um, and sometimes we're able to reconnect them with who they are um, outside of the hospital because we understand that they have a whole experience, um, life experience that makes them who they are. These are just some examples of the work that, that we do. Um, we have, um, this is Melissa, our dancer, dance and movement specialist. 
And um, she works in a variety of settings. She does a lot of her work in the Center for Psychiatric Medicine, um, as well as some other uh, healthcare institutions, um, specifically in behavioral health. But it, this young woman in the middle, she um, was a uh, patient in the heart-lung transplant ICU. She also happened to be a dancer as well. And so people may think that, you know, to dance, you have to be able to physically move around space on your legs, but that is not the case. You can dance with uh, fingers, arms, toes, eyes, and your imagination. So, um, so that was a really nice opportunity for her to um, re-engage with, um, with her passion that she has when she's not in the, the hospital. Melissa also provides um, opportunities for relaxation, um, seated yoga, and those types of things. We do a lot of um, textile work in the UAB Women and Children's um, Infant Center. Here we work with uh, women in the high-risk obstetrics unit, along with moms and dads in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, as you can see, um, the piece on the left took a lot of work, um, but we have a lot of moms and parents who um, get really engaged in once they've learned how to do the embroidery and the quilt making. Um, a lot of these are group workshops. Uh, and so with women, particularly in the high risk obstetrics unit, uh, of course, they might be there for weeks or even months at a time. They have a much longer um, than average length of stay. And they um, oftentimes can experience um, loneliness and isolation. And so when we're able to bring together um, the women in a group, um, you know, anybody who knows about quilting and, and um, quilting circles, quilting bees, um, can knows that bringing people together to um, to sew to create allows for a lot of conversation um, and connection, and so that's one of the um, the beautiful things that come out of um, groups where um, moms can engage in sewing and embroidery. It also provides um, you know a, a way to mark. Um, this time in their life, it uh, can be used as a narrative tool as well. And um, we have a lot of um, success in that program. Now, oh good, this one looks like it's gonna work. Um, this is just an example of one of the, the projects that we've done, uh, it's about three years in um, the Women and Infant Center. be her first costume make her like um a candy corn <laughs> and i think that'd be cute because she's sweet as candy as it is her dad and i went to a party city to see if we could find her costume for halloween of course they didn't have anything small enough for her so i thought this was like really great came just in time now i'll keep the costume definitely so she can kind of see how small she used to be this will be a great memory i think And um, even with COVID, we were, even though we weren't able to go into the space to work with the parents, um, we were able to get materials delivered and create some videos to allow the, the parents to continue their work. Um, this, we, we typically serve about 20,000 people annually, primarily through um, the healthcare space. Um, but we also work in adult uh, day programs for individuals with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, like I was mentioning, our creative aging program for independent assisted uh, living facilities. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about a magic camp that we do in partnership with the UAB School of Health Professions, Occupational Therapy Department, and then programs like Dance for Parkinson's Disease um, that are community-based. So moving on um, to arts and caring for caregivers. The arts can be a tool for addressing caregiver burnout and compassion fatigue. Um, healthcare institutions are finding 
that um, a healing physical environment and uh, innovative particip participatory arts programs can contribute um, to uh, addressing professional medical staff issues such as low pro productivity, high turnover, adverse patient events, um, poor service, and, and low patient satisfaction ratings. Um, and so, you know, this is the, um, the definition used by um, the, the ICD that uh, explains about burnout, um, but it's an uh, occupation-based um, stress condition that um, there's energy depletion and exhaustion, increased mental distance, um, feelings of negativism or cynicism related to job and reduced professional efficacy. And, um, you know, different studies have, um, sh have indicated that um, in the last couple of years that 44% uh, of physicians report um, experiencing burnout, 41% of nurses have reported uh, symptoms of burnout, and that 96% of uh, medical professionals believe it's a problem um, and should be addressed. And um, so, you know, one way of addressing this is um, it's, arts can be used as a, you know, one facet of a multifaceted approach, but the arts, uh, as we have talked about, um, can provide relaxation, so it can be a great tool for, for self-care. Um, we've actually partnered with UAB Medicine Office of um, Wellness for different events, uh, and we also um, partner with the UAB Employee uh, Assistance and Counseling Center um, for a um, bi-weekly Zoom program called Self-Care Studios. Um, and so we can just provide spaces, again, for um, retreats. We do retreats for addiction recovery um, staff um, that really allow them to have time to uh, relax, um, engage in creativity and, um, and share experiences. So Story Power, um, UAB Story Power, Voices of 2020, we just had that, but we had people from all throughout healthcare um, tell really uh, personal stories that they wanted to share um, regarding their experiences with the pandemic, uh, with racial inequality and injustice, uh, and, and all sorts of other things that have been happening um, during 2020. And so it's all an opportunity to, to let people um, relax, give voice to their experiences, um, provide some kind of normalization of the experiences and um, engage in some tools for self-care. So this is um, an example and unfortunately it's not, my video is not working, but um, there's a dance company called Stuart Pimsler Dance and Theater Company. They're out of Minneapolis. And for um, over 20 years, they've been working in healthcare. Um, and they started a program called Caring for the Caregiver. And they've brought it um, all over the, the country and into places like Israel, Russia, Taiwan, Mexico, and, and more. And it's um, the programs uh, allow. Uh, for physicians, nurses, medical students, hospital staff, social workers, and others um, to uh, share their experiences and participate in guided uh, movement and exercises. And um, it also allows them to, to gain tools in um, self-care and um, communication with, with patients. So arts in... Um, Medical humanities also continues to increase. Um, research uh, suggests that um, physicians and medical students can benefit when arts are included in clinical training. Um, uh, some of the uh, outcomes include increased empathy, improved observational and diagnostic skills, enhanced communication skills, and um, an improved ability to treat people um, at different stages of life and from different cultures. Um, some different examples exist um, throughout different um, medical schools that include um, 
you may have heard of, of narrative medicine. There's uh, the first narrative medicine program um, was at Columbia University. Uh, and it incorporates elements of medicine, public health, social justice, and humanities in its curriculum um, while teaching students to build personal and meaningful connections and interactions with patients. Um, other examples of this are the use of theater as, as a tool for uh, medical professionals to, to use as a, an educational um, device in schools and different community settings. Um, also to teach improvisational skills and again to enhance um, the, the patient uh, physician uh, interaction. And then um, there's an example right here at UAB. Um, I think they've been working on this project for about uh, since 2011. Um, and it's a partnership. It's called Prescribing Art, uh, How Observation Enhances Medicine. And it's a partnership between the School of Medicine, um, the Abrams Engel Institute for Visual Arts and the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. That was a new addition this year. Um, and uh, so Dr. Russell, he's the one who started the program and um, uses the medium of art to help medical students achieve impro improved observational skills um, in clinical encounters, their perceptions of biases, and in their tolerance of ambiguity and uncertainty. Moving into the space of arts in community health, the domain of arts and health, um, it's an innovative um, way of delivering art. Um, arts programs and initiatives um, are being introduced and have been um, in use for diverse community groups. Many of these programs are grassroots initiatives that bring cultures and generations together through uh, traditional and folk arts. They um, take place through formal um, institutions and informal networks uh, across arts, medicine, education, social service uh, sectors, and through faith communities, neighborhood groups, and, and other networks. Um, support, uh, they support wellness for aging adults and people with chronic illness. Um, there are many outstanding organizations that provide opportunities for people with disabilities to engage and thrive by developing arts practices and vocations. Um, there's an increase in um, professional dance and theater companies for people with disabilities. Um, and we've actually had Axis Dance Company at the Alice Stevens Center. I want to give a little example of our Aging Creatively program. It was a precursor to arts and medicine, um, where we bring arts classes to HUD subsidized facilities. Um, and these are led by professional artists who teach weekly classes in the visual arts, um, dance and movement, group singing, theater, creative writing, and more. And our goals for this program include um, social connection, uh, opportunity for creative expression, increased self-efficacy and health and wellness benefits offered through exercise and um, cognitive stimulation. And actually we, um, in partnership with the UAB School of Health Professions Occupational Therapy Department, we um, are working on a small feasibility pilot project to look at the possible benefits of engaging seniors in a twice weekly, 10 week ballet curriculum. Um, at the end of the sessions, the performers who were between 70 and 94 years old also visited another site and they had a joint performance for uh, residents and visitors. So here is a little example um, of one of our programs. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it go. 
There are um, many programs that focus on arts uh, for individuals with disabilities that promote general health and wellness and can be paired with the work of health professionals to help people reach therapeutic goals. Um, one of those examples uh, is uh, the work of Kevin Spencer. He works with children and adults with physical, cognitive, and intellectual disabilities. And we have a great partnership. We bring him in, he's from Virginia, and um, he goes all over the world um, talking about the importance of um, arts and his use of magic um, for children and adults with um, various disabilities. And so we've been partnering for the past three years with the School of Health Professions Occupational Therapy Department to provide um, this uh, magic trick um, protocol. Uh, in the first year, we started with children with um, hemiplegia. And this year, we did that two years. And then this year, virtually, we were able to open it up to, um, <clears throat> to kids with uh, other disabilities as well. And um, this is just a little example of, of one of the, the, the classes that he leads with um, the OT students. And hopefully he'll be back uh, in January to do this again. It doesn't fall apart. There's no pieces of elastic, metal snaps, rubber bands, magnets, anything that would be turn around so everybody can see. <laughs> <laughs> How's yours, Haley? Good? Cool? Yeah? Excellent. How's yours? Good, good. Do you have a long piece of rope? Do you have a medium sized piece of rope? Do you have a short piece of rope? I'm going to take the short end of the rope up to the short end, the medium end of the rope up to the medium end, and the long end of the rope up to the long end. And now we can kind of make these look like they're the same size, right? But they're not, unless we do this. You can end up with one medium sized piece of rope, two medium sized pieces of rope, three medium sized pieces of rope. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is not a good trick, guys, if you can't do this. To pull out one short piece of rope, <laughs> one medium sized piece of rope, and one long piece of rope. Now, what I, what I absolutely, you guys are now picking up your ropes and your But as soon as I start tossing those out to people, now you are vicariously checking out the rope through the people that you know in the room. And you're, in your mind, you're going, hold on that just a little bit harder, because I need to make sure that that's real, right? And then once I get them all back and I start in, I see you guys, you really set up these chairs. Right? You kind of leaned around to make sure that you can see what was going on, right? Because everybody's engaged. And when I start doing the trick, some of your hands go like this. <laughs> it's all of those little signs that say to us that you're engaged, that you're motivated to watch what's going on. How awesome it would be if when our clients came into a therapy session, they had that same sense of wonder and imagination and engagement of like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And so, um, so Kevin's background is, well, he um, spent 30 years uh, touring the world with uh, an illusion show. Um, he experienced a traumatic brain injury um, about 20 years ago uh, from a car accident. And he tells the story of having to go through all the, the physical therapy and the occupational therapy and um, really didn't enjoy it. And But when he went back to his um, basic magic tricks, he found that a lot of the, um, the movements, the gross and fine motor skills that were needed to, to recreate those magic tricks 
um, were the same were targeting the same areas as um, some of his occupational therapy and physical therapy. And so um, over the years, he's worked with um, occupational therapists who did um, task analyses of his magic tricks. And now uh, he's, he's able to teach uh, the students. And so the students that you saw in those videos were the ones who were able to partner with um, two students to one child. Uh, we had 46 children this past year. Um, virtually, and um, to continue to be able to provide that that magical element of of um, you know working to achieve the therapeutic goal. Another project that we're working on with Dr. Dr. Han Yuan and the School of Health Professions OT is a we just started a ten week expressive writing program based on the work of John Pennebaker. Uh, for people with acquired spinal cord injuries. And we have two writers who have been trained in expressive writing for health and co-created the curriculum. Uh, we're hoping to work with about 36 uh, participants via Zoom. Um, and it's the, the people who are enrolling are happen to be from all over the country. So that was uh, uh, something we didn't expect going into it, but again, using the virtual Zoom has allowed us to really expand. Um, but looking to see if there's an association between the writing intervention and uh, grief processing. Uh, and we had our first uh, sessions this past week. And so we're looking forward to see um, what comes out of that. Um, so finally, we've gotten to arts and public health. And well, arts pro oh, so Jill Sankey is um, with the University of Florida, a Center for Arts and Medicine, and she has really been working to um, to move the arts uh, more into the public health realm to to collaborate with uh, public health professionals. And she says, throughout human history, the arts have been used to accomplish the very things public health is currently challenged to do support well-being, transform systems and cultures, spark and sustain movements, communicate across difference, and create social connection. They are therefore vital collaborators in advancing population health. So while arts programs that promote community-based wellness and health promotion have been in existence for generations, it's only in the last decade that um, intentional efforts have been made for arts organizations and institutions to call for collaboration um, with the public health sector. Uh, and so Jill Sankey and um, her team, uh, again, this I'll uh, provide um, a link to this resource, has created a white paper that um, incorporated the views from over 250 thought leaders from the fields of public health, arts and culture, and community development to present a case for why collaboration is needed between public health and arts and culture to advance health, well-being, and equity in America. And they make the case that key collective uh, key collective health and well-being issues, such as trauma, racism, um, and mental health, tie directly to social and structural determinants of health, and that collective action is required to address these issues. Um, specifically, innovative, collaborative efforts that are responsive to culture, lived experience, shared beliefs, and practices of shared meaning making. Uh, the arts and culture sector is positioned um, to be one of those collaborators and could be a key component um, in the fifth wave of public health. That, that idea um, is described by Hanlon and colleagues. It's described as a new health paradigm stressing need for cultural change. And they go on to say that there's no single action mechanism for advancing health. And instead it must be woven in the fabric of social life, including policy, education and sociocultural norms. And arts and culture are, are a key piece of integrating this process. And some of these uh, will hopefully sound familiar from uh, the beginning of the talk, but they can make ordinary, the arts can make ordinary moments extraordinary. Um, it can, they can provide direct health, health benefits, such as increased physical activity, stress reduction and connection, um, improved health communication and education efforts. Um, Arts-based modes of communication make the information clearer and more accessible and memorable. 
um, increase participation. Arts and culture generate widespread interest and they can be fun and they should be fun sometimes, a lot of the times. Thus, they can optimize health program reach and participation. Um, they can facilitate help with a dialogue facilitation, the safety and sense of connection created in arts and culture activities um, facilitates dialogue even um, regarding difficult issues and across differences. Um, and those, those conversations can reduce stigma and isolation and increase access to care. Um, they can help connect services when health and social services are physically integrated with arts and culture spaces access to services can be increased. Uh, they can advance community-led and community-generated and community-sustained health practices. So because every community possesses arts and cultural assets, the integration of arts and culture into health promotion can translate to sustainable community-led efforts and new social norms. Uh, and finally, organize and, and mobilize. As arts and culture blends um, into new media and as technology increases, the reach and diversity of ideas, arts and culture help people connect, mobilize, and organize for change in new ways and at unprecedented speeds. And really all of this um, comes from this Creating Healthy Communities, um, the white paper. And so you can learn more about that effort um, and I can provide you that information. Um, but they've also created, the University of Florida has also created an evidence-based framework for integrating arts into public health initiatives. And they've identified 59 key health, come, um, health outcomes and evidence. And we're really, we're pretty much out of time, but I just wanted to, to end with um, just the arts can be great for, for education and health promotion. And these are all specific to COVID-19 that have um, come about obviously just in the past uh, eight months. And like I said, I can provide you with all of the, um, the resources that I named um, specifically around um, the University of Florida resources and the, um, the World Health Organization um, scoping paper that they commissioned by psychoneuroimmunologist Daisy Fancourt.